Welcome to the Visionary Chronicles. Uh, we're, we have a very special guest on this week's podcast, David Meltzer. David's been a guest across many high-profile media platforms, such as Entrepreneur, TEDx, ESPN, and Forbes, where he's a top 10 speaker. These are just a few of the high-profile outlets David's been a guest on, too many to mention. I've only got him for a short period of time today, so those are the only ones I can mention for now. But I got to tell you, he's got a long list, so we're very privileged to have him on today. So in addition, David also hosts the popular shows Office Hours, The Two-Minute Drill, and is host of the Playbook Podcast. And his life mission, which is very impressive to empower over one billion people to be happy, I love that mission. Um, I'm not sure where you find the time, David, but I'm glad you're committed to these principles. Um, you've impacted so many lives along the way. So I'd like to welcome David Meltzer to the Visionary Chronicles podcast. David, how are you today? Fantastic. We got this Meltzer Meltzer combo. We should yeah. be able to empower so many people with a vision of their potential. So thanks for having me. Yeah, David and I had a little quick conversation yesterday. Um, on our name and how similar it is and how we're missing out on the seltzer um, side of the business. So we were hoping that we could combine the names and be able to get a little licensing off of that. But no <laughs> such no such luck. So so again, very privileged to have you on, David. I want to get to some questions and kind of how I do this, David, is I do a little bit of past, present business life and day to day. So we'll get to many of these as we can. I just want it to be an open dialogue and have us talk about this today. And my opening is, I, I always mention this because I'm a good old German boy, as I'm sure you are. And I grew up in North Dakota. And people often ask me, what, is a, what does an Eskimo look like? And I said, well, um, I'm not an Eskimo, but I did grow up in North Dakota. So I'm curious, where did you grow up and, and how did that affect who you became? Well, I was born in Akron, Ohio, which had, I think, a great impact on me because my dad left when I was five. And my mom was a single mom with five kids who worked two jobs, packed her dinner and paper bag between the jobs so she could fill up turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards just so we could eat. But through my long journey, I realized that people that are from Ohio especially have a different work ethic. They have a different perspective on consistent, persistent pursuit. And maybe it was, you know, the rubber capital of the world at Firestone and the blue collar uh, type of environment that Pittsburgh and Akron had. But I found that, you know, one of the biggest blessings in my life is that I have an Ohio character and I got to move to San Diego when I was nine, but I lived in Ohio long enough uh, to establish the character and the work ethic that my grandparents and parents had in Ohio and in a more laid back environment uh, in San Diego, California, I really, uh, stood out when it came to consistent, persistent behavior. Yeah, I, I've got the same, David. I've got that Midwest bloodline, and people often ask me, I says, I wouldn't have traded growing up there for for anything. It just instilled these values that to this day I, I still carry with me and very fortunate to have. Um, the second follow-up on that real quick, David, is what, do you want, what did you want to become when you were young? <laughs> You know, it's an interesting so, question, right? You, well, it's easy know. for me because <laughs> I, I thought about it every day from the day my dad left that I just wanted to be rich. I was a kid who even in second year of law school, sitting on the end of my bed when my oldest brother passed away uh, while I was in law school with $100,000 of law loans in a recession in the early 90s, sat on my edge of my bed and said, God, if you let me pay off my low, law loans, and become rich enough to buy my mom a house, I will shovel shit with my hands six days <laughs> a week, 12 hours a day, in gratitude, in gratitude. So my only mission was, was to be rich. And I thought sports was going to be uh, the modality that would make me rich. But I fell back into what my mom believed our biggest strength was, which was education and uh, went to law school and provided me so many options, opportunities, and touches of favor when I graduated. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I think we're I think we're both have the bloodlines of Midwest, but now we're officially Californians. So it's uh, yeah. But we never well, forget. I'm Midwest still a Viking. I'm still a Vikings fan and a Twins fan. So right on. Well, those are good places to be fans of. And uh, I shifted <laughs> over to the Chargers and the Padres, so I'm in much more pain than you are. But <laughs> I always tell people Midwest is a great place to be from. Yeah. Yeah. We get our value for the money. And I say that with the twins roster all the time. 
value <laughs> yeah. value for for money so but yeah so that's always a, a great starting question david so that the next is kind of getting into the business side which our listeners love to to hear about is these visionaries and entrepreneurship i know we have a passion for two things one is uh, uh entrepreneurship and the love of sports um and 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 when you look at these visionaries you know, we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, so I'm going to have you follow up on this question. It says, you know, who would you say today is a visionary and why? And, and for those that didn't hear the answer yesterday, I'm sure you're going to hear it again, which is great. It was a great answer. So, David, who would that, who would that be in your life or who would be a visionary and why? Yeah, well, I said in my life, it was Lee Steinberg, uh, who is the most notable sports agent in the world. They made the movie Jerry Maguire about it, and I was blessed to be the CEO of his company. But... I would have been hired to run the most notable sports agency if Lee Steinberg wasn't a visionary. Before anyone thought about sustainable practices, Lee Steinberg created the Sporting Green Alliance. Before anyone had a blog, uh, Lee Steinberg and uh, uh, Steve Young uh, sold a $25 million uh, blog for sports. Uh, most people don't know that. Before anyone saw that even, he hired the CEO from Samsung the phone division, that would be me to be the CEO of a sports agency, even though I wasn't even a certified agent at the time. I had a law degree, <laughs> played sports in college. So uh, my personal experience with the greatest visionary would be Lee Steinberg. In public, I think the greatest visionary is Elon Musk. And I know we talked about Twitter. Uh, people are very short in the way that they see things. One thing about visionary uh, visionaries is, they often get into trouble because they see things much longer than other people see them. And I became someone who thinks very, very long. I believe in aggregate effect and compound interest. And Elon Musk is such a long thinker. I know this short-term purchase of Twitter uh, seems to be the first really, really bad move from this visionary. Uh, but I'm not counting out. Uh, the genius uh, of Elon Musk and, and what he's doing. And we'll see 10 years from now, just like I've seen other people laugh and scoff and make fun of visionaries. Uh, eventually they applaud them. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. It's those that can see the future while others are doubting it are the ones that break through those barriers and, and find success somehow. And, you know, I'd look back on, on Thomas Edison where I said, if he would have stopped, if he would have stopped at nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine in the light bulb, we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have light in our world. So it's a, an interesting dichotomy with people when they, you know, the risk takers. And the other one I always listen to too is Seth Godin, where he said, "Safe is risky." You know, it's one of those things where entrepreneurs don't have that in their vocabulary. But um, you know the the you know these visionaries at some point, David, they're they're entrepreneurs, right? And you know, what would you say? is probably the most difficult part of being an entrepreneur. I think rejection. Um, you know, I think other people's opinion and rejection are the two most difficult things, not just from people we don't know, which is hard enough, uh, but there's something called ignorant arrogance that people get confused about. And so uh, out of any profession, entrepreneurs face ignorant arrogance. And ignorant arrogance is easy to take, as I suggested, from the people that you don't know, meaning the haters of the world are just going to laugh at you, scoff at you, and make fun of you. That's easy to take because you know they're ignorant and arrogant. But the ones that are really creating the most resistance in an entrepreneur's life are the people that love us the most. And let me share with you why. And I can only tell you this from my experience of being a parent. I came to this epiphany. I am so much in love with my children that I am more afraid for them than I am for myself. And therefore, I find myself in a perspective of ignorant arrogance out of love, not hate like a hater, but out of love that I give my kids advice that sucks because I'm afraid for them. And this is a very big detriment to an entrepreneur when your parents and your siblings and your aunts and your uncles and your best friends who you know love you more than they love themselves are telling you, doctor, lawyer, or failure, don't start that business. The internet's a fad. That's a bad idea. You're going to lose everything. Or even worse, our wives, our spouses. 
And what we don't realize is the difficulty that we have with ignorant arrogance doesn't lie in the haters of the world who we can discount and laugh at them laughing at us, but it's the people that love us the most that cause us the most detriment to being entrepreneurs, to being visionaries. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. You have to have people other than yourself behind you as an entrepreneur, I was, I was one that literally started with nothing at a blue collar family and built something out of nothing. And I kind of take offense to some people that loosely use the word um, entrepreneur when they start with a hundred million dollars and make 150 million. There's not a whole lot of risk in that. So, no. so that's well, a great, at someone that started with nothing, made over a hundred million, lost it and made it back again. Yeah. So I know the, I know the value of what you're talking about. Even more impressive, David, and why we're, why we have you on the visionary chronicles today is to tell that story. So it's a amazing story. One that if, if wasn't true, you probably wouldn't believe that that actually happened. So <laughs> I always um, tell people if I knew what I had to go through in order to get to where I am today, I'm not sure I'd have uh, the nerve and the, the, the nerve, like just the energy to do it. But we, you know, as entrepreneurs, we don't know what it's going to take. Yeah. So, so somehow we just keep <laughs> going in that Midwest attitude. We'll just keep going. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you've gone through it. And my wife laughs at me all the time. She says, I've got a lot of dog years on me from being an entrepreneur. You know, it's like for every five in a regular business, the entrepreneurs, you know, it's like 10 or 20. So it's, uh, sure. you age really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guaranteed. Hey, so, so on that, David, just a quick one, um, quick answer to this one. I, 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 they ask me this all the time and I think it's kind of an interesting one. It says, if you could have dinner with one person, Dead or alive, who would it be? Jesus Christ, no Good. doubt. Yeah, for sure. It would solve so many problems. Yep. <laughs> you and you and I have that in common, so that's a great thing to to have in common. The net the next thing is is what I call kind of life, you know. And and you, you talked about family. You talked about the support that they've given you over the years, and having that Midwest upbringing. I'm sure from your parents is, you know, what's the most important lesson you've learned in life? ask for help. I know it's not one that a lot of people talk about, but people ask me, how the hell do you lose over a hundred million dollars? Cause I thought that I had to do it myself. I didn't realize that true humility comes from asking for help of others, finding people who sit in a situation you want to be in and asking them for help. Good. Very, very good and concise and, and useful answer. Um, so here's a couple others, quick ones. What is your biggest passion? Oh, <laughs> Kindness, yeah, by far. This, Good. It's simple, just kindness. I'm passionate about being kind and teaching other people to be kind. Yeah, and, and I, it kind of an add-on to that, David, mine is, is always been humility, you know, being humble, right? It's, it's just leaders that forget that many times to share, share in, in the riches and rewards of your life, and nobody's done it by themselves, but that's a, that's a, a great one. And the other one, which is on the other side, is what keeps you up at night? And my kids. <laughs> okay. And they're okay. older. They're yeah. Older. I, they, don't, they, they don't physically keep me up like they did when they were under five. Yeah. I, but that's, yes, that's, that's the that's... only thing I fight of the biggest fear is, you know, I just, I love them so much that it, it obviously has an equation that unfortunately brings about fear. Yeah, I, I have the same, whether they're, whether they're brand newborns all the way through, I've got kids that have now gone through college and I still worry about as much as I did when they were six months old. So well, my, I, my I mom can... worries as much about me. She told me I'm 54, so I don't think it ever ends. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other one, which I'm sure is going to be your children is what's the proudest moment of your life? Yes. Uh, you know, every day. Uh, my, my children bring so much. They bring three things to me. I tell them all the time, love, pride, um, and of course, defense, meaning I always have their back. So I tell them every day, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I always have your back. And I think it's important as parents and employers, whatever, we, we have to know how much that someone has our back. And, you know, I don't know if there was something when I was young because I lost you know, my father left and I didn't have anyone that I felt had my back, but it makes a really big difference when you know someone has your back. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great answer and and one that we're all very proud of to have family 
and also ones that support you when you're down so you can support the others when they're down. It's a, a barrier of life everybody faces, but you can't help others unless you've been through it yourself, which you certainly have. <laughs> so it's a great experience. So so a couple quick ones. Other, also, David, is a, kind of a quick day-to-day. -day. And it's I, I love these questions because they ask me is, what, do you, what are you not very good at? <laughs> <laughs> Patience. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at patience. And uh, yeah, just I, I work on it. I know it's ironic, uh, pragmatically, if I have infinite patience, everything will happen immediately. But I just can't practice what I preach. Yeah, yeah, we've all been there. And, and what's your favorite book? Uh, two books. So Think and Grow Rich, uh, okay. Napoleon Hill, I read every day. And A Course in Miracles, I read every day as well. Uh, so those are the two books that I read every single day. Good. I know that's a, for me, I've got my bookshelf of a couple hundred books and they asked me that question. And I really got to think that one out. So, but those are two great ones that I have in my shelf as well. So I reflect on those all the time. And so, um, Hey, on the, on the podcast, I know you've got the popular, the playbook podcast. And the question is what made you want to create the playbook podcast? Uh, Gary V. So I had a radio okay. show and six years ago, Super Bowl, he said, Dave, you need to have a podcast of all these amazing people. You're the Napoleon Hill of podcasting. You're the only one that can bring thousands of the spirits of excellence. And you're such a great interviewer. You got to do this. And I was like, dude, this is six years ago. There's <laughs> way too many podcasts. I'm too late to the game. There's 200,000 podcasts there were at the time. And he said, Dave, you don't get it. You got to do this for me. Trust me. And so I said, who could I not trust? If Gary V is telling me I have to do a podcast, then I started doing them every Tuesday. And now I do 10 a week. Uh, I do an entrepreneur one and a sports and entertainment one called The Playbook. And we are over 1,400 episodes in in six years. Wow. Wow. Um, and you get no sleep at night. <laughs> there, I, I have an unwinding routine. I, I, I I great recovery and access. <laughs> Another great piece of advice for people to make sure they go to sleep every night to recover and access the information to plateau and grow and accelerate every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Gary's very persuasive, so I'm sure you probably couldn't have turned him down on that one. So no. <laughs> um, and, and what was your most successful episode and why do you think it did so well? Wow. So I'm not even sure what the most, let me tell you, I do know the when second did it stick out most, in your mind. Yeah. The second most downloaded one. So oh. I've had everyone from Deepak Chopra to Sadhguru, yeah. Tillman Fertitta, Jerry Jones, <laughs> I have Cameron Diaz, Dan Aykroyd, Gary V, Rob Deerdeck, but Bill, you, anyone you yeah. can mention I've had but the one guy that has the most is Mike Mooseberger and Mike Mooseberger was a cup of coffee NFL star who had a tremendous story about how his brother, who was a drug addict, uh, was so high that he killed his own family on accident mm. when they came home late at night. And then Mike struggled trying to, by himself, process and deal with the murder of his entire family, including his brother. When he woke up after being on drugs, he killed himself when he realized what he was doing. So as a Wake Forest superstar football player, he got called off of the sidelines to find out his whole family was dead. And then he talks about his journey of trying to do it on his own. And it, if I get choked up thinking about it. I'm not going to spoil the, the, the episode, but if you want to watch or listen to an episode that will change your life, download the playbook and listen to Mike Mooseberger's episode. Forget Ray Lewis. Forget Apollo Ono. Forget your favorite <laughs> fans. Mike Mooseberger's the most impactful episode and second most downloaded episode next to Ed Milet. Uh, and Ed and I just make magic together. So we're very popular and our audiences love us. So that's why I think it outdid Mike Mooseberger. That's great. Isn't that, isn't that great with podcasting? Now you can tell these stories and, and it could be anything, right? I mean, I listen to you ask me anything, David, and I'm amazed at the questions you get asked and you're able to, you're able to come up with an answer. I, I, I never ceases to amaze me. So, but the, the podcast, it's fun to be able to tell these stories. So, so I, so an ending here, I wanted to kind of ask you a couple of things, David, and again, thank you so much for being on the visionary Chronicles today. We obviously are, again, are very privileged to have you with us and I have a couple final questions. Um, one is what's your favorite quote? 
Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Good. And a final piece of advice for our listeners. Well, I, you know, I gave the one, I want to reiterate it. Ask for help. Live in radical humility. Uh, if There's two things you can do with help. Is One, find someone in a situation that you want to be in. Ask them for help. But also, when I talk about asking for help, find out how you can help others. Uh, so the two fastest ways to get to where you want to be is not only finding someone that's already there for directions, but helping someone get what they want. Those are the two fastest ways to get what you want. And both require somebody asking for help. Perfect. Great. Thanks, David. I really appreciate it. And for getting more information with David, um, he's got a free copy. That's amazing. Of his book at uh, just email David at, yep. at David at, at D Meltzer, D M E L T Z E R. I know that dot com for a free copy of his book. And he also has free free Friday trainings, which is also amazing. So both of those are available on David's uh, website at dmeltzer.com. Again, David, thanks for being on the Visionary Chronicles today. A privilege to have you. And you have a great Thanksgiving with your family and friends. Thank you. Let's do this again. I'm here to be of service. And Brian, thank you for providing such great knowledge, not just in this episode, but in so many to your community. It is appreciated and impactful. And have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Perfect. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. And have a great Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye. -bye.